So here I am reporting from Baku, Azerbaijan, where I participated in the 15th Verona Eurasian Integrations Forum. And uh, this is my first time in Baku on the Caspian Sea. So what you see here behind me is the Caspian Sea. I have to say I'm quite impressed. Uh, Baku is a beautiful place. Azerbaijan feels and looks like a relatively prosperous country. People look good, they look healthy. And uh, I have to say that Baku itself is uh, quite a beautiful city. I must say I'm a little bit surprised even. Uh, lots of new architecture combined with Soviet style architecture that's also everywhere and uh, lots of people around parks places to sit down it feels vibrant I have to say it feels vibrant and uh, I must say I'm very impressed from what I have seen so anyway you know uh, today I delivered my remarks uh, on the financial part of the um, of the forum, of the conference. It's the 28th October Okay, so now here's a short report about Baku at night. That place there is a big shopping mall just by the lake, by the Caspian Sea. That's Hilton Hotel with lights in the color of Azerbaijan flag. Uh, traffic, it's as bad as anywhere, but generally People drive nice cars. I was surprised. Most of the cars you see on the streets in Baku are quite nice, expensive cars. Yeah, and so uh, again, Baku has been a surprise. It's a beautiful place, really impressive. And uh, it definitely feels like a very livable city. Uh, people feel relaxed, they don't feel tense. They don't feel, um, how do you call it, kind of, you know, they feel chilled out, relax, uh, relaxed, uh, and uh, generally in good mood, from what I could tell, at least. And, uh, yeah, so that's to give you a, a little sense of uh, the capital of Azerbaijan. Never thought I'd travel to Baku, Azerbaijan, but there I am. In fact, I haven't pretty much traveled anywhere since since the lockdowns two years ago. So this has been a bit of a refreshment for me as well. All right, signing off. Thank you and see you soon. Bye. The West's war addiction is related to an obscure and poorly understood economic phenomenon called the deflationary gap. American historian Carol Quigley wrote that deflationary gap was the key to the 20th century economic crisis and one of the three central cores of the whole tragedy of the 20th century. To understand the deflationary gap, let's consider an economic system that produces a certain quantity of goods and services. The total of all the price tags attached to these goods and services represents the aggregate cost of producing them, plus profits. That money is income to those who receive it and represents the economy's total purchasing power. On the whole, aggregate costs, aggregate incomes and aggregate prices are all the same because they represent the opposite size of the same transactions. For the system to be in... that's okay, go ahead. <laughs> 
For, this for the system to be in balance, aggregate prices should exactly absorb the system's total purchasing power. The problem arises because people normally prefer to save a part of their income, which reduces the total purchasing power available in the system. That shortfall of purchasing power is the deflationary gap. But today's monetary system makes it imperative for an economy to grow. If it doesn't grow, it inevitably generates crises. It is what William Corbett called starvation in the midst of abundance. To ensure growth, governments are forced to intervene and restore sufficient purchasing power through government spending. The best way for governments to intervene is to invest in productive capital goods, since this will increase the national wealth and standards of living. But in the West, this approach tends to provoke ideological opposition since it is regarded as socialism. Instead, Western nations seem to prefer the most dangerous method of bridging the deflationary gap, which is military spending, as it can be easily justified on the grounds of national security and patriotism. Military spending enhances the wealth and political power of the military-industrial complex, as well as its influence over a nation's foreign policy. We can clearly see this in the recent history of the United States. Its military spending amounted to approximately 1% of the GDP during the first 40 years of the last century, excluding World War I. After the Second World War, this has increased by almost five times. But my remarks here are not intended as a criticism of the United States. Any nation that adopts the modern fractional reserve monetary system is vulnerable to this system. As I mentioned earlier, the evolution of the system can be traced back to the Bank of England. The bank was established in 1694. Over the following 120 years, England prosecuted fully 18 officially declared wars against her then rival power, France. Back in those days, the British hated France almost as much as they hate Russia today. But hatred does not arise from the common man. Its roots stem from the monetary system that has evolved for nearly 500 years now. The purpose of my remarks here was to highlight the systemic flaw that has led human societies in the direction that most people don't, didn't want. Many of us in the West recognize Eurasian integration as a new hope for humanity, a crossroads where we can choose a different path of development. We can replace hatred with love of mankind, war with constructive cooperation and mutual respect. I think that the leadership of Russia and China inspire some confidence that this future is now possible, but it will depend on all of us to make sure that we can shape it for the benefit of our children and for their children. So that's that from me, from Baku, and uh, until the next time. Thank you and bye-bye.